Okay, uh, welcome. It's my pleasure today to introduce Wayne Saslow as our colloquium speaker. Wayne doesn't really need any introduction. He's been with us for a long, very long time. Um, but uh, of course, uh, you know, one should uh, pay homage. So uh, let me just mention a few things. Uh, he received his uh, education at the University of Pennsylvania, UC Berkeley, and then the PhD at UC Irvine, if I read this correctly, in 1968, and then joined the faculty here at Texas and then in 1971. So indeed, professed for a very long time. Uh, of course, he's well known as a condensed matter uh, theorist, but uh, looking over his body of work, it seems there maybe always has been a second love or maybe a first love in communicating science in a clear way to an audience. I think uh, uh, a textbook, uh, got a teaching award and has published articles in journals like the physics teacher. And that's one of the things he's going to talk about um, today. So, um, oh, and I should say on the colloquium committee, he is the one who uh, keeps us honest about the quality of speakers. And uh, so he has an, uh, an opportunity to show us how that is done properly today. So I'm looking forward to it. Uh, Wayne, here we go. Okay, great. All right, thank you very much, Rana. Well, I hope I pass my own exam for quality of, of the talk. Uh, let's let's just start it. Um, by the way, it, it it it's not working. Thank you, Roland. Let's try this again. Is that working? Louder. Well, okay, I'll make it a little. How's that? All right, great. Okay. <clears throat> it has been, I realize now, about two years. Think about that, that we've been dealing with COVID. And I have just decided that, okay, it's probably safe enough for me now. So I'm going without a mask. But I was pretty good about it for an awful long time. Uh, so let's, let's just get it started here. And uh, I can't really see what, there we go. Okay, too much, too much. Okay, here we go. So there's, there's the, uh, the title. Uh, and it is uh, named after a, a spaghetti Western made in Italy, starring Clint Eastwood. And there's the, uh, uh, the announcement of it, a film of Sergio Leone. And Clint Eastwood is the guy on the left uh, over there. And uh, just want to remind you, it's not, not these guys, none of whom is good, and probably all of whom are ugly. All right, now, so oh, this is terrible. I've got this blocking. Is there a way to undo that? Yeah. Oh, that would be great. I should know how to do that myself. I don't. Video panel. Oh. And high loading media controls. There we go. Fantastic. Okay, great. Um, Okay, I will make believe I know what's going on. Okay, so here we go. Voltaic cells for physicists. I'm gonna to try to make it fairly quick, but it just drags on. Okay, because there's history. I'm gonna go in inverse order historically. We got from, from the ugly to the, uh, um, the bad to the good. The good came with Faraday around 1832. Uh, there he's, that's not a cigar, that's some sort of scope. Uh, and to explain his experiments in electrochemistry, um, which was the, the Faraday's laws of electrolysis. Uh, he had to invent ions and electrodes. It's chemistry, okay? And he found that the action was at the electrode electrolyte interfaces and the chemistry gave the EMF. I'll give you a better idea what I mean by electrodes and electrolytes or what he meant, I should say. Well, the bad came with Volta in 1792. Uh, there's, there's Volta, he didn't understand what was going on. He, he incorrectly thought that the physics, which we would now say was the work function, he could develop an electrochemical series, but um, it was um, 
uh, one associated with work functions effectively. He thought electricity, that the electricity came from the metal metal contact and therefore he added extra layers of metal as in here. And I'll show you that again in, a, in, a, in another figure just to hammer the idea home. Uh, so he didn't understand it, okay? He, there was, he knew there was chemical stuff happening, but he ignored it. He had, he was told, you know, he, had, he, he could have said, well, maybe it's this and maybe it's that. Maybe it's physics, maybe it's chemistry, but he came down on the side of, of the physics. Uh, and uh, so now we have the ugly Galvani. Now, you got to give Galvani credit. You might say, oh, he got it. Oh, terrible. No, he's the first one to discover it and he made it reproducible. And it took him many years in his electrophysiology lab to make it reproducible. He is the guy who discovered in effect that there was myelin that was a sheathing on the, you know, the nervous system, okay? So even though he looks bad here, even though he looks ugly, he was a truly great scientist, okay? And there he is, and there's one of his frogs or frog's legs. And uh, he thought the, the electricity was from the frog volume. Now, just so you know, the frog was serving both as what we would call an electrolyte, but it was also serving as his detector. And the reason that Volta was able to make advances was because Volta had already studied capacitance and voltage and all that. You know, good old Q equals CV. Who did that? Volta. Okay, we are not giving him enough credit for, for the sorts of things he, he did. So he knew how to volt measure voltage and charge uh, separately. And, um, you know, he could get rid of the uh, frog as a detection device. And he also got rid of the frog as an electrolyte. But we'll, we'll get to that. Anyway, um, so anyway, uh, Galvani thought animal electricity gave EMF. And here's a very important point, going back to the beginning. He needed different metals as to close the circuit. Here's different metals. You see those, those guys in contact, all right? He needed different metals for this effect to show up. It took him a long time to decide that was what was going on. There are lightning stores, st storms in, in the hills around his laboratory that got in the way that sometimes made the frog's leg twitch. And he had to work very hard to make it reproducible. All right, so now I'm gonna to try to get to the, the whole story quickly. I wanna repeat this. Volta had unnecessary metal layers at the ends of his battery pile. I bring up the word pile. How many of you are European? You know what pile means, right? A battery. Batteries are just piled up voltaic cells, okay? Now over here, what we've got is, is an example of, of the, the, the contact. And notice, this is exactly what Volta had. He had an extra layer here between, let's see, red is silver, silver and zinc. This layer was not needed. That layer was not needed. Just totally unnecessary. Uh, and um, so the, the, this, here's a summary of the idea of a source of EMF. Okay, according to Faraday, Volta, and Galvani. So this is one pic picture that shows it all. Okay, so what do we have? We've got two electrodes, E1 and E2, in between an electrolyte, which is typically, a, you know, an ionic fluid, salt water would be good enough. And uh, uh, here are two wires, as, uh, as in the different wires that, that Galvani used. But in fact, it's not necessary, we now know, to have different wires, just as long as we have different electrodes, it's fine. And, and in fact, in this figure up here, this M1 and M2 are the same, but this is a little bit of an homage to uh, uh, Galvani who had these different metals, okay? And so th the idea is that Faraday said the action was at the E1, E, e the electrode electrolyte interface and that the other electrode electrolyte interface. Volta said it was at the contact between the metals, okay? Uh, which for Volta was, uh, it would have been there, those two points and those two points. Uh, and so it would be two points. In this figure, there's just one contact point. But for Faraday, the action was at those two contacts between the electrode and the electrolyte. Uh, the electrodes have to be different. Okay, the wires can be the same. And for Galvani, the electrodes and the metals were the same. Okay, so 
Uh, here's just some motivation for so many years. I taught the typical post 1950s battery picture. All right. Uh, before 1950, it was taught semi correctly, right? but it made the chemistry seem to be too significant. It is significant, but it made to seem, it seem as if you need to know details of the chemistry. In the end, I'll talk about some details of the car battery chemistry, but not at the beginning. At the beginning, it's simple. Okay, so uh, the, the, this physics textbook battery picture leaves many unresolved questions. And by the way, you notice the way I'm clicking and getting something coming up one thing at a time. One of my pet peeves about teaching and colloquia is that we flash too much stuff on the screen at once. All right, so by doing this, and it's not easy to do, and you, you know, I've worked on this, I've slaved on this. Uh, 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 I, I can control the flow and hopefully keep your attention. All right, now, what is EMF? We don't talk about what re EMF really is, okay? Different size cells can have of the same material, can have the same EMF. What's going on? What's the difference between a battery and a voltaic cell? Well, the answer is simple. The voltaic cell is the fundamental unit, okay? And, well, uh, you know, a battery might, like, if you have a, a nine volt transistor battery, that's got six one and a half volt cells inside it. Um, they don't really talk about how chemistry produces the EMF and that there are two distinct electrodes. You don't know, have to know too much in the way of details. I'll, I'll, I'll explain that. And I won't actually do details. I'll just say the magic words, but you guys will know hopefully what I'm talking about. Um, there are figures that indicate that the EMF occurs within cell volume as with Galvani's frog, not, sorry, Okay, there's no discussion of chemical charge and energy storage. Okay, it's simple to do, it's not done. Then why is this weird imaginary dotted box drawn around the voltage source and the internal resistance? Internal resistance? Outside? Not, it's inside. All right, there's no discussion of the differences between fast charge and discharge and slow charge and discharge. Okay, I mean, the way when batteries go bad, when you try to start the car in the rain and you've got an older car and it won't start, blah, blah, what's going on there, okay? Uh, there's no estimate of the internal resistance of a typical car starting battery. I'll show you how to do that. It's not hard and it, it's great. It's just really neat. Okay, so here's a quick correct view of voltaic cells, two surface pumps and an internal resistance, okay? That's it, just repeat the mantra two surface pumps and an internal resistance. Two surface pumps and an internal resistance. That's it, okay? All right, now, what is EMF? Well, Maxwell tells us, it, it's really, what he says is it's anything that drives a current. And for a wire, it's a voltage difference. You'll see books that never talk about voltage difference as being an EMF. It is, the great Maxwell said it is, I'll give you a quote. So the ugly here is they tell us that EMFs arise from batteries and from Faraday's law, no mention of voltage, okay? Here's, a, here's something for which, you know, a wire, all that can drive current is the voltage. It's gotta be an EMF according to Maxwell. All right, so, um, so by Ohm's law, there's a current, Maxwell wrote that whatever, uh, an EMF is whatever drives a current. So voltage difference across the wire is an EMF. And here's the quote. The difference of potentials between two conductors or two points is therefore called the electromotive force between them. All right, so much for the textbooks, okay? All right, they just copy one another, all right? Um, so now, uh, voltaic cell, EMF depends on the electrode reactions. So here, we're gonna label two electrodes, one and two, and the EMFs that pump out of the, the uh, cell, uh, pump charge out of the cell are E1, and E2 and the net EMF is the difference, okay? So here's a simple example. And I've drawn the internal resistance inside, not outside, inside, because it really is inside, all right? The net EMF is E2 minus E1. And note the following, if you've got an identical electrode reactions, there's total cancellation, which makes sense. No one's winning, right? It's a tug of war and no one wins. Um, the internal resistance is inside the cell. And the action is at the electrode electrolyte interfaces. And here's a bit more detail of, of what's going on. So here we have a cell, we've got wire leads 
Uh, we've got two different electrodes. I probably should have labeled this electrode two and electrode one. Okay, and in this case, the current is driven that way. And you've got an e, E2 go over there and E1 dry, going in the other direction. And we've got a dipole layer there to just cause, at least in equilibrium, e, uh, uh, no current flow. All right, so there's some charge transfer uh, that will occur anyway, even without current flow. And it will be a, less of a dipole layer when there is current flow. Now, this explains why small AAA and large AA cells have the same EMF. You can pic picture it like this, but if this is an A cell, a AAA cell would have much less stuff. That's all, less fuel. All right. The EMF comes from the chemistry of the electrodes, and A, a and AAA have the same chemistry. EMF is not a volume effect, it's a surface effect, okay? Uh, and the internal resistance is a volume effect due to ionic, not, uh, not electronic conduction. Uh, now, here's a comment. I've asked myself, why do they use a picture with the internal resistance outside? I think I have an answer, and I'm writing it down as if I really know. I never really know. I don't even know if my shoes are tied. Why do many textbooks put internal resistance outside the cell? Well, here's a picture, typical, okay? Um, well, the, if you believe in a galvanic-like bulk charge pump, the voltage rises linearly in space, okay? Voltage rise linear in space, I, that's ugly, okay? Galvanic, whatever. For short times, it is true that which that's before ions have a chance to move. So a very short pulse of current, you turn something on, you turn it off. The ions satisfy an Ohm's law, giving a resistive voltage. Ohm's law, voltage varies linearly in space. You've got two things that vary linearly in space. You can't represent the, the total voltage and distinguish between them. You could make two different graphs, I suppose, on the, on the same figure, but you couldn't give the net effect, all right? And so I think that is why that is that you can't distinguish on the graph between the, these two linear dependences, okay? And so they just don't do that. Yes? So, uh, my It's intellectually lazy, okay? It's intellectually lazy. It's, it's really as simple as that. It says, oh, I don't wanna take the time to, to learn about it, all right? And I've seen that, okay? And I've, you know, what you've said is what a lot of you know, people have, have told me. And it's just, you know, we're supposed to be physicists and figure out stuff, okay? So it, it means we have to take some sort of responsibility for this, all right? All right, so now let's talk about different voltaic cell types, different chemistries. Not all AAA cells are the same. There's traditional carbon zinc, or, or, which is related to zinc chloride. It has something to do with the, the chlorine in the electrolyte, or I don't know, it's the detail, okay? There's nickel, nickel metal hydride and nickel cad, NICAD. The alkalines are different, but all these have nearly the same EMF. Uh, I, I do want to comment, though, that I have replaced uh, in, in a, a scale for weight, uh, one kind of battery with another, and it didn't work. Perfectly good, fresh battery, it didn't work. So there's some difference, and I don't know what it was, but you can have these things with either slightly different resistances or slightly different EMFs, but it, one, would work, one battery would work with the scale, the other battery would not, I don't know why, but you know, clearly they're different. Um, so let's see. The, the different types of materials have different charges per unit volume. For, for a AAA, I just read this somewhere. Nickel metal hydride has a, a, the largest, then come the alkalines, then old fashioned carbon sink. And that is in fact the, the order of, of, of cost, I think. No, it's not. Yeah, yeah, right. Nickel metal hydride is the most expensive than the uh, alkalines, than the, the carbon sink. Okay, nickel metal hydrate is expensive in part because it's rechargeable. So that, that's maybe that, that's not a fair comparison. These do have different internal resistances, which depends on material and design. And just as a comment, a moderate intensity flashlight needs three alkalines in series, 
but a high intensity one needs three nickel metal hydrides in series. It, it, this is just details, 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 doesn't matter, okay? So, but from this, you can conclude that the nickel metal hydride has a lower resistance than lower, I said it in the wrong, or, yeah, lower resistance than the alkalines. And these are the numbers, okay, that I came up with by some sort of comparison that I'd forgotten about, I did it years ago, okay? And just more details, don't care about that. I, I do want to make a comment though, that non-current producing chemical reactions constantly occur in all voltaic cells, thus discharging the cells without using current. The current producing uh, reactions are called Faradaic. The ones that don't produce current are called non-Faradaic, if you talk to an electrochemist, okay? And um, it's, this explains why all voltaic cells and batteries eventually discharge. And you know, if you take a lead acid cell and you don't drive your car and the lead acid cell in your car, if you don't drive it for a couple of weeks, what's gonna happen? It's gonna go dead, right? That's because you've got this battery acid, sulfuric acid eating away at the electrodes and it, it does bad things. And I'm not gonna talk about those reactions anymore, but just be uh, aware of that. Okay, now what do chemists do for batteries? Well, so they want energetic reactions, but not so reactive that there are explosions. Lithium is more reactive than most, so it's got a larger EMF. And John Goodenough, a physicist wearing the hat of a chemist, came up with the lithium electrode. Goodenough, by the way, is in material science now at uh, UT Austin. And he's like 98 now, 99, he just got the Nobel Prize. I was pushing for him with Dudley Hirschbach for, for a few years to try to get him. And so finally he got it. I, I feel as if I pushed a thimble's worth of whatever in that direction. Louder? He, he was an undergraduate as a, a mathematician and then went to graduate school at Chicago, worked for Clarence Zener. And I just read an interview which said, he, he, Zener wasn't so sure about taking him, waited a day and said, okay, fine. You just have to do two things. One, you've got to come up with your dissertation problem and then you've got to solve it. So that was, that was the guidance that Zener provided him. Uh, so here he is, okay, and this is a great man, all right. Uh, now, just a comment, why are batteries in volts? The chemical bonds are in electron volts, okay? How many people do we ever teach that? If you think about it, it's obvious, but you know, very often we just don't think, okay? And just a comment now, how do you get the electrode EMFs? You look at thermodynamic equilibrium for each electrode. You match the Gibbs free energy for the reactions involving electron transfer from the electrolyte to the electrode or vice versa. Okay, so you have the electrode, electrolyte. You match the Gibbs free energy. There's a voltage difference that when there's no current flow, meaning the Gibbs free energies match, then you're in equilibrium and that is what you mean by the EMF. Okay, so you do it for two of these guys. Or if we knew about the details of the chemistry, we could calculate this, but that's how you do it. It's no big deal, okay? Uh, conceptually. So we've got two electrodes, so there are two EMFs. Now, the detailed chemistry is important, but we summarize it with a single number, the EMF. Okay, what about the charge and the energy? U, they depend on the cell size. Triple A, A cells have different amounts of chemical reactions, uh, reactants. Uh, in short, they, we, if you call char chemical charge capital Q, that is proportional to the amount of the least prevalent chemical reactant, okay? You can have extra of some kind of chemical reaction that re reactant that's not gonna be used, doesn't affect the so-called charge of your battery. It's how much, can be, how much charge can be provided until the battery appears to, to discharge or as we sometimes say, go dead. Okay, here, simple equation. Energy storage is approximately given by that charge times the EMF, that's it. Very simple, okay? To makes total sense, right? Has anyone ever seen this? You did? Yes? I had not, I had to write it down, okay? They don't get, they, we're, not, we're taught not to think about batteries, to say, oh, chemists don't, no, the chemists don't know anything. They know about the chemical reaction. I, and if there's a chemist here, I 
please excuse me. Uh, but they, but they, you know, it, it's broken up into slices. There's the physics slice, there's the chemistry slice, and you, you, you have to do a certain amount toward getting the whole picture together. EMF, the EMF, electromotive force. So it's that E2 minus E1 from the two electrodes, okay? Go, to go back, okay? Where do we have it? Come on, go back, go back, go back. All right, that's the EMF for the battery. There we go. So that's how we get it. We have to... It's a volt. It's a, it's a voltage associated with a thin, sort of a cross, a thin, basically a cross an atomic layer. Okay. All right, so let's get to where we're supposed to be. Um, and uh, all right, so let's just put in some numbers. Uh, a fully charged battery, card battery might have a charge of 50 amp hours. Has anyone ever you know, looked at what the amp hours are for a, for a battery? It's gonna be 50, 60 amp hours, okay? I only looked at that when I got interested in this stuff, okay? And if you've got a car battery with a 12 volt EMF, and really it's more like 12.6, uh, it stores Q times Z, you take the product, okay? 50 times 12, 600 watt hours, a certain number of joules. Okay, big deal. All right, now discharging, Q discharges the energy. Okay, when Q is zero, the cell is totally discharged, it's obvious. But a discharged battery is not necessarily a dead battery, okay? We're two types of battery, batteries. The non-rechargeable cells, like AAA cells, okay? They're called primary, they're not rechargeable. And then there are rechargeable cells that are called secondary, like lead acid cells. Okay, so now I wanna talk a little bit about voltaic cell discharge. Until the cell is nearly discharged, the EMF is at nearly its fully charged value because it's the same chemical reactions that are taking place during the course of the discharge, okay? And um, near uh, the, uh, when you're near full discharge, other unintended reactions start to take place, okay? So that's the way I should have said that. Um, let's assume an initial charge of 60 amp hours. And uh, I'm gonna give you a number associated with incandescent car lights, okay? Six amps. I, mean, I just read that off of, uh, off of the, the specs for, for some lights that I bought, okay? Uh, and which is a moderately slow, but not really slow discharge rate. So how long is it gonna last? Well, it's easy. You take the time, the time is the charge over the current. The charge is 60, the current is six, 60 over six, 10 hours. Leave the car lights on overnight and what happens? The battery goes dead. Now I wanna tell you, I was very convinced of this, that it was really, 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 really true. Okay, and then, one of our colleagues here, Peter McIntyre, related to me that one day, you know, knowing what I told him, he thought he would just see if it was really true. And so he went out after the car seemed to be dead, went inside the house, had a huge breakfast, probably qualified as a lunch, and then came out somewhat bloated and tried to start the car. It worked. The car had not been completely discharged. Maybe he had a, a battery, that had stored more charge. But really, this is getting to something else. It has to do with non-uniform distribution of chemicals within a voltaic cell, okay? And so we're, we're, we're gonna be getting to that. Anyway, here's what happens if you have a simple discharge of that, that 60 amp hours going down at six amps per hour, it'll last 10 hours. Um, now, I wanna talk first though about internal resistance. Uh, you can get that from in, from impedance matching. I was really happy when I did this because I put together all sorts of physics I knew about. Okay, so what did I know? Okay, for a power source A to provide maximum power to a user B, what do you do? You match something, okay? Now, if you're playing tennis and a racket is the power source, the ball is a user, and you use a tennis racket, not a ping pong racket, you match the elastic properties. Everybody knows that. All right, so uh, what happens when, when you ma have maximum usage for a car, the car battery, that's when you start the car, okay? The maximum power demand 
is when you start the car's gasoline uh, electrical motor, which in turn starts the gas motor. All right? So, so what we're going to do is we're going to match the electrical resistances on starting. Okay? So what do we know? Well, there, with two other facts, we can determine those two quantities, little r, the internal resistance, and big r, the starting motor resistance, which should be about the same. Okay, so um, the car battery has a known EMF. And I know from Super Bowl ads that uh, cold cranking amps, a good set of cold cranking amps, num a good number for cold cranking amps starting a car, it's about 600 amps. Typically it's not that high, but I'm just picking a nice number that's gonna give us simple you know, amp answers, okay? And so let's just apply this. The current is gonna be the EMF divided by the internal resistance and the starting motor resistance. And if you then set little r equal to big R, and, and just do the algebra, you get I is E over two little r, cross multiply R is E over two I, E is 12. Two I is two times 600, that's 1200. 12 over 1200 is 0.01 ohms, okay? That really is a good value. I, I've, I've looked it up in different places over periods of time. And um, it's, it, it was that value held in the 1930s, okay? But it still holds now. I'll comment on that very briefly. Um, but also I know someone who's measured it. And he told me, yeah, it's about 0.01 ohms, all right? So keep that in mind. Now, why did that value not change with time? Why was it still true now than in 1930? It's because you, you want to have batteries and starting motors that can be replaced over the years, okay? And you don't want to suddenly have the technology change. So to maintain that, they've designed starting motors, they, the, the engineers who do that sort of thing, starting motors and batteries that are about, have about the same property. So as time goes by, and you change out a motor or a battery, motor with a new car, of course, typically, or you change, get, replace the battery, you want everything to work efficiently, you maintain that same value for the internal resistance and the starting motor resistance, all right? So, I mean, that's just wonderful. Um, okay, and I you want, want to comment that textbooks often give a huge one to 10 ohms in figures that have car batteries. Okay. Uh, oh, here's a comment. Um, I cannot help myself. Okay. I know. I know a certain amount of history. Okay. Um, everybody knows about Sadi Carnot, but almost no one knows about Lazar Carnot, who was his father. Lazar Carnot was a military hero in, in the French Revolution. He was a physicist. He was an engineer. He was a mathematician. And one of the things that he was interested in was efficiency of mechanical engines, getting mechanical power from one part of the device to another. And he basically said, no clacking, no sound, make it a smooth contact. That basically is match your mechanical impedances, okay? And so armed with that idea, Sadi Carnot came up with the corresponding thing for idea of matching, for th thermal matching match the temperatures, okay? And that's, that's what he did, okay? Now he didn't say that, he didn't honor his father, but I'm absolutely certain. I can't ever prove it, of course, but I would bet, oh well. All right, there we go. So, all right, so now here, just more, more stuff. Voltaic cells, right? Current so AAA battery is a really <coughs> a single voltaic cell. Okay, EMF, chemistry, battery, blah, blah, blah. Okay, a nine volt battery can be six voltaic cells in series, but it could also be two 4.5 volts, the newer kinds, lithium cells, okay? Um, car batteries, many voltaic cells, both in series and parallel. There we've got one of those guys. And here's an example of, what, of a lead acid cell, okay? So we've got the two, two uh, electrodes, one lead oxide, the other one uh, uh, lead. Okay, red for the lead oxide, which is kind of pinkish. And this lead cathode is drawn as blue, but it's really grayish. And there's the, the electrolyte, which is H2SO4, and it's very ionized. So it, should, it really should be uh, drawn differently. And I will draw it differently uh, in the next figure. But um, so the EMF of each of the electrodes is associated with a chemical reaction causing current 
to lead the voltaic cell. There's, let's make up numbers. I'm making this up. I have no idea. Measuring those EMFs is not an easy thing. What's the EMF for a given electrode? I don't really know how uh, the professional electric chemists do that, okay? Uh, but anyway, you can get two volts by taking one EMF to be 1.4, the other to be minus 0.6. So in terms of driving current, one provides 1.4 and the other one drives 0.6, okay? That's, that's the basic idea. And um, so here's an example of a sort of real voltaic cell. I put in an internal resistance, an external resistance. We're gonna use those EMFs I made up before, 1.4 and, and, and minus 0.6, but I'm gonna take little r to be 0 0.1 ohms, not 0 0.01, just I'm making up an example. And, and um, all, uh, charge the battery with two amp hours connected to an external resistor of 0 0.5 ohms. And um, this, is, uh, this is something I, I, I meant to change and I didn't get around to it. No, depicting internal resistance inside the voltaic cell is obviously incorrect. That obviously should be uh, outside, right? Okay, how many people say it should be inside? How many people say it should be outside? Okay, yeah, I would wanna know, right? Okay, all right, there we go. So now let's find the EMF find the current, find the discharge time, find the voltage jumps associated with the resistor and the electrode. Okay, just simple numbers, okay? EMF, take the difference, E2 minus E1, two volts. What about the current? EMF over the sum of the resistances, two volts over 0.1 and 0.4, that's sum of 0.5, two over 0.5 is four amps. How long does it last? Okay, the charge, which I set up here is two, divided by the current, which is four, so it's gonna be it's gonna last a half an hour in this simple picture, okay? We know something, okay? This is, this is getting to be something like serious knowledge. It's not precise, okay? Because batteries are more complicated than that, and I'll get into it. What about the voltage drop across the internal resistance? Twice, because we know the current is, is oh, wait a second, did I mess this thing up? IR. I think I put in the wrong numbers here. Oh. Bad Saslow. Okay, I is four, R, little r is uh, 0.1. I don't know, I, I must have changed the numbers in my example. So this should be 0.4, no, their numbers are different, okay? But, you know, you, you, we can do that calculation. Four times 0 0.4, 1 1.6, whatever it is, okay. Uh, and, now, and now here's a new idea, but it relates to what I said before about the matching the Gibbs free energies. The electrode EMFs are really the voltage drops. Okay, so we, uh, uh, for, for E2, which is now on the right, that's a 1.4 voltage jump. And for E1, it's a, one point, it's a 0 0.6 voltage jump. And here's a picture, okay? So we've got zero volts at this point, okay? And we're gonna pump this current this way. What happens is we gain 0 0.6 over at that first electrode. We lose, it's really 0.4 is what we lose. So we go from, 0.6 minus 0.4, 0 0.2. We gain 1.6, pop up to one, uh, whatever it is, 1.4 plus 0.2 is 1.6. And then we lose, lose 1.6. Uh, oh, the shame of that, I got the numbers wrong. Okay, at, at the, uh, that should be a 1.6 that we lose over here, okay? All right, so, um, and there, that's where the jumps are. All right, uh, and now, we're gonna talk about the lead, depleting the electrolyte with leaving the car lights on overnight. Slightly different example, headlights are six amps. I'm make, taking a charge that's 48 amp hours, not 60. I don't know why I did that. Like, but anyway, the discharge time now is eight hours, okay? And um, I wanna comment that even leaving the headlights on for an hour can make the battery go dead. It's not really, but if you wait 15 minutes or so, the battery will appear to recover. What's going on? Okay, look inside the cell. You've got two electrodes separated by electrolyte. There are chemical reactions at the electrode electrolyte interfaces. They deplete the battery acid ions locally near the electrodes, okay? For high current drain, local depletion occurs before overall depletion. There's a picture, high current drain. Okay, this is what might happen if you try to start the car in rainy weather and it won't start and you keep cranking. 
okay? Cranking is a term that comes from when there were no batteries and you had to literally put a crank into, into the, your old 1920s car and turn a handle, okay? So you crank now electrically, you crank and you get nowhere in rainy weather. Okay, and the elect you get depletion over here, and then it appears the battery is dead. But you wait for the, the ions then can diffuse from the bulk electrolyte to the surface. And here you get relaxation. And now you've got a fairly high ion density. The car will start again. Uh, now I'm just gonna go with a bit more in the way of, of what's going on here. How long? Uh, I was hoping to get done sooner, but I mean, we're, get, we're, we're, we're mostly through. Okay, so we've talked about fast discharge from electrodes and then relaxation. Okay, uh, what about really slow discharge when the battery really discharges? There's that. And leaving the car lights over and on overnight is not really that. Okay, I didn't draw a figure for that, but it, it corresponds to having a lot depleted at the edges. Okay, so if I were to have a, a curve, my curve would look like, if I have this sort of thing, it would be, so here would be num plate number one, plate number two, and this would be the ion density. All right, and really, well, okay, that, that would be a pretty good idea of what's going on. Um, and I, the comment is, is that the incandescent car lights, it's only a moderately slow uh, uh, rate. Um, what about fast charge of a dead battery? Okay, well, so you've got, a, if you have a dead battery, you, you've got zero, okay? And now you wanna give a fast charge to the electrode region, boom, you've got that. Now, if this happened to you at night, someone charged, gave you a charge, you charged up and you, and you verify that the car starts fine. You think, oh, great, I'm okay. I'll work tomorrow morning. No, what's going to happen? Well, obviously you wait overnight and you're going to get relaxation. You're going to have a very low ion density at the electrodes. Forget about it. The car's not going to start. All right. So, um, and uh, just, I'm repeating this. Boring, boring. The main point here is I repeated, I, I'm, just re, I'm repeating myself here, drive a car with a dead battery for only five minutes, it will recharge, but not by much. So the next day, they will not start the car. Uh, okay, here's something I'm gonna flash through very quickly. Yes. So, can I, so um, you said the, the eight hours that the car lights stay on, uh, that could be to a situation that is more like the more fast discharge. Um, a little bit like fast discharge, that's so, right. And it so, can recover. So um, the diffusion of these ions is slow. Because it's slow. Yeah, exactly. It, it, it's very slow. So that's not I mean, it's, it's yeah, it, it, it is. Okay. Um, I, I, I wrote a paper where I made some estimates and I know it, I wasn't bothered by the numbers, uh, but I can't pull that out. Um, it would be something to talk about later, but I, you know, I'm not going to do that. I want to talk about the, the, that the fact that the naming of electrodes is not uniform. Um, battery people name them once and for all. Okay, let's say we have a car battery here. Um, a for the anode, C for the cathode. Once and for all, that's it. Um, they follow the convention of Faraday on discharge inside a cell looking at it from the point of view of discharge inside the cell. Now, we don't think of it that way, but Faraday, when he was developing the laws of electrochemistry, cared about what happened inside the cell, all right? So uh, just keep that in mind. So in this picture, the current internal to the cell leaves the cathode and goes to the anode, but our view normally is we think current external to the cell leaves the anode and goes to the cathode. All right, chemists follow Faraday. Faraday was interested in what happens whether things charge or discharge. If something discharges, then um, you're going to have the naming convention that the battery engineers use. If it charges, Faraday says you reverse the electrodes because the current has reversed. Okay, the naming of the, of, the, of, 
will 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 reverse. I don't want to go into it anymore. Okay, but be aware of that. And physicists use our third convention. Let's not worry about it. Let's just get out of here. I want to talk a little bit about what happens inside the lead acid cell. Okay, where this is real now. The chemical reactions are not that important here, except physicists know and love boundary conditions. Oh, give us a boundary condition and we're happy. All right, well, the chemical reactions at, at the, the electrodes give us boundary conditions, okay? And here's what's happening when you have a, a, a lead acid cell discharging. And I want you to look at the HSO4 minus. It's weird. It's going to the left on the left side. It's going to the right on the right side. Switch a sign. Weird. Okay, what about the hydrogen? One unit to the right when you're on the left side, but three. Okay, it's not uniform. Okay, this is weird. Okay, it's not what we're used to. Okay, and so there are the two charge carriers and we can get boundary conditions from this. And in general, the ion flow is driven by electrical force and diffusion as described by the planck nernst equation. And in general, it can only be solved numerically. Uh, but for slow steady discharge, it can be solved analytically. Okay, there are two variables, or three rather, two ion densities and a voltage. And there are three equations, planck nernst for each ion and Poisson's equation for V. All three of these are, it turns out, are linear in space for slow steady discharge. I should have said that, I didn't. Uh, and in that case, the voltage is quadratic in space. I'm gonna show you, okay? And you know, you'll recognize it and, and you'd say, oh, I, that's in, in, contained in Einstein, but they did it first, okay? Um, so here I'm gonna show you uh, the slow steady discharge of a bathtub. So here we have a picture of little Richie. Does anyone recognize little Richie? Who recognizes him? That's little Richie Feynman. He's a careful observer. And here we've got slow steady discharge of, of a bathtub, there's 100 units per second flowing through that plug, okay? And he notes that the flow prof profile varies linearly from the back end to the front end, okay? And so you can plot it, the flow rate like this. I made up this story. W when did he do this? He didn't. Come on, sorry. He didn't, I made it up. I was trying to give a, a physical picture to my father who didn't know calculus from beans. And, and you know, I, I, I thought of this for the slow steady case, which was what I had studied. Ah, let me think about a bathtub. And then for, for purposes of making it, you know, more interesting, I thought, let, let's introduce little Richie Feynman because that's the kind of thing that Feynman could have done when he was a kid. And for all I know, he did, okay? Prove me wrong. Okay, so here we've got slow steady discharge of the lead acid cell. I'm just repeating things. Here we've got the fluxes uh, on the left and on the right that I talked about in the previous slide. What I've done now is I've drawn a straight line because just as the voltage varies linearly in, 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 in uh, um, how can I say it, the flow, uh, varies linearly uh, for the bathtub problem. It turns out the, 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 uh, the flux is very linearly also. Okay, same idea, all right? And where we go? So we, we have this. All right, so now I'm gonna show you, oh no, it came up in the wrong order. Okay, there are, let's just go through. You set up the problem. You count the knowns and the unknowns. You've got two ion densities, two ion fluxes, two continuity equations, which are here. You've got two planck nernst equations, the ion currents driven by the electric field, and the density gradient. So here's one for the hydrogen, okay? All right, so there's the current of the hydrogen. There's the conductivity of hydrogen times the electric field, and then it's driven by density, opposite high density. And then for the sulfate, same story. Okay, just repeat, replace the sign. And then we've got a Poisson equation that relates those. Okay? And 
Yeah, they did this around 1890. So Einstein was 11 years old. Well, well, oh, that's interesting. I don't know whether Planck did it before quantum mechanics. It was it was about the same time. I mean, 1890 is about the same time. I, I don't really know. Um, so Einstein invented I, I don't know. I don't know. I I I I think. That was a 1905. Yeah, what's what's a century or, or so between friends? Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I I agree with you. Okay. Uh, um, so um, here's here's a little bit more. Just how the solution goes. Okay. You just all you have to do is plug it in. You, what you find out is the density gradients for the numbers are exactly the same. Okay. Uh, but the, the bulk densities are not the same, okay? It's, but to get overall electroneutrality, you've got to have a charge layer within the by uh, Huckel screening light of, of the electrodes. And that's, that's well known. And we, here's a picture of what it looks like, okay? What the voltage profile looks like if you were to measure it. I don't think anyone's ever measured it, but, but that's what it looks like, okay? Uh, now, we're, we're almost done. What about other physics with multiple charge carriers? Okay, semiconductors, electrons and holes, ionic fluids, salt water. In fact, um, lithium is sort of like an ionic fluid. It's not really a suit, it's an ionic solid. There, there are lithium electrodes and things called super ionic conductors, biological cells, ion channels and ion pumps, uh, spintronics, conductors with spin up and spin down electrons, okay? And here's some references, okay? Physics Teacher, which is, was pretty well cited. American Journal of Physics, both kind of popular. Here's a PhysRev letter that kind of got me started, okay, where that figure of the voltage profile being quadratic was, is from. And just other stuff. Oh, this is interesting in that it talked about the ordinary sur uh, uh, surface reactions associated with a lead acid cell. If you just have a uh, one plate reactive in acid, okay, with a piece of leads and, and battery acid, you get a, a, a non-trivial voltage profile, okay? And it's, it, there's no net current flow, but to, to have that no current flow, it's, it's kind of complicated. Okay, um, and another thing is if the joule heating rate need not equal I squared R, where R is the ohmic resistance, okay? It's more complicated than that. Okay, so I'm done. How close did I come? O almost on time. Okay, thank you. Questions, questions, questions. Because the natural chemistry of those cells is around one and a half volts. Yeah, well, that's the most that they can get without with common materials. And they do, they they have different chemistries that get that one and a half volts. They'd like to get 20 volts. Okay, but the best they can do right now, anyone can do, is, is lithium, which is around four and a half volts. And you have to watch out because it could be explosive. So Peter. Yes, that's a well-known phenomenon. Thank you.
I, I, I didn't, I don't think I said, oh, thank you. You're right. Okay. Um, the, the question is that there seems to be a contradiction between uh, saying that if you let a cell sit there, it will discharge a lead acid cell. Uh, but that it, it appeared that I said that you get the EMFs. When you get the EMFs, you do it by matching the Gibbs free energies, which is an equilibrium situation. Therefore, there's no reactions. And um, the, the answer is I was really talking about simply how you would get the EMFs, assuming that there are that there's no current flow. And, and in that case, by the way, there is no net current flow. The reactions that make the battery go bad are reactions I did not draw, okay? That I, I did not write them down. I've got that, that in, an, in another you know, like a paper, that, but they would not have current. It's a different chemistry, yes. No, it won't. You'd have to drive the car. Now, for example, um, it, it is well known to people who um, have motorcycles that um, uh, they have to, 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 when they get the battery replaced, they go to a battery store and the battery people have to take their, the battery off of the shelf, put the acid in and, and then charge it up. And why do they do it? Why don't they just take it off the shelf? It's because it would have discharged because they don't during the time between sales of motorcycle batteries, which are not that frequent. Uh, another example is, is um, uh, 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 lead acid cells are used for uh, um, starting motors on um, uh, lawnmowers. And if you go from one season to the next, almost certainly that battery is going dead. Is there anyone? Besides me, to whom that has happened? Okay, but I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to give you a hard time. Uh, I really think that, that, yeah, okay, deal. By the way, my batteries go bad all the time. <laughs> Wait, what does this say for this uh, layer? It's gotta be, you know, you know okay. Five, yeah, five angstroms, you know, a couple of atoms there. The, the bihuckle layer in our, in our ionic medium. So it's gotta be very short, lots of screening. Uh, I mean, really bad, uh, uh, electrochemists would talk about stern something or other layers and gooey chap and, and stuff like that. And I'm trying to avoid getting into that kind of detail. I wanted, the, the big picture is voltaic cells have two, surface pumps and an internal resistance. That is the thing. Yeah. Yeah. The details will, will absolutely change. Yes, I'm sure. Um, Mm -hmm. And then uh, the side is not so. Well, that involves semiconductors, and the and the ion densities are fairly low compared to what you have in in a very highly ionic fluid like sulfuric acid. Sulfuric acid has a lot of ions and a very, therefore a very short uh, screening length. But with a semiconductor, the ionic density, the, the the charge densities are much lower and the screening lengths are much larger. But, but, but the, uh, all, all this EMF on this side. I don't know, but maybe we could talk about it later. I'm not quite sure what you're referring. All your EMF is on this uh, surface. It's, it's across the yeah. interface between, it's something like that. Yeah, so approximately. It's got some weird profile. It's just got some weird profile and, and it, yeah, atomic scale. And it, it, it's weird and probably even real detail, ex, people who know real details probably couldn't be, couldn't answer for sure what's going on because 
you know, these things have atomic corrugations along the surface. There will be wiggles that probably transverse to the, along the surface or as big as the wiggles as the decay into the material. So it's, it's, it's really hard to answer. I'm sure a precise answer can be given to a precise question, but it's hard. Yes, neither. Absolutely. Um, no, be, because if it's open circuit, there's nothing that, that, that closes. Oh, but then you say that there's a, there's a voltage difference that develops between the plates that compensates the chemically driven EMFs. But that's what happens, okay. Right, and that, that, that avoided what's happening at the electrodes, which is what I think. All right, if you'll let me represent it, the, the interface as some weird region with its own inter, internal resistance, then, then I would say, that what you, you do is you say, okay, this region has a certain internal resistance. There's, there's an EMF that would tend to drive current one way, but when it drives current, that means it's pushing charge there. So they're gonna develop a back voltage and that will stop the, the current flow. Does that sort of answer? Um, okay, I, I had not thought of that objection. Okay, but I, I, I'll, let me think about it some more. Maybe I can find a way to answer it. All right, well, thank you. Uh, thank, you. thank you very much. I enjoyed it.